Hey everyone, Jason here from Off The Beaten Path and welcome to another video. Uh, I've been a bit busy with work lately so they have been a bit slow coming. This was the last video we, we recorded before heading off on the variety trip and we've gone back to Dandongadale Spur on the Buffalo Divide track, headed up those hills, down the Walsadine track and then along Abbey Yard Road before crossing the Buffalo River, up the Durling track, over the tail end of the Mount Buggery track, and then the intention was to do the Yarrabula Creek track through to probably uh, Mount Selwyn. That didn't happen. Uh, this was the last time I had some, some vehicle issues just before the trip, and after this, the vehicle was in the mechanics workshop for about a, a week or so waiting for spare parts, um, as you'll come to see. Heading off to Dandongadale Spur track, uh, and then um, Yarrabula Creek track, We've got Matt in his Prado, Sam in his MUX, me in the Pajero, and Mark and Jared in the Colorado. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, there's a bit of water in the in the lake. The sky's got some grey in it, so we'll see what the day brings. So here we are, heading to Dandongadale Spur Track, just airing down at one of the campgrounds alongside the Aviard Road. Um, as you can see, King River's down here. That would be the Buffalo River. Looks like it's uh, not too full and not moving too fast. Uh, we'll be crossing this later today. So, uh, not a bad little camp spot here. Um, a few different spots under the trees. Should be a good day. Blue skies and the sun shining. Tracks are a little bit damp from some overnight rain, but uh, not wet or slippery. So from there, after airing down, it's just a short run along the river there. Quite a nice drive. The road was in really good condition. This particular road does tend to be fairly rutted, um, corrugated, I should say, not rutted. Um, and uh, further down, it's quite twisty. So um, this Walsedine track that we're driving on today, I should say the Dam Buffalo Divide track is a, is a really good alternative entry if you don't want to do the bottom end of the Lake Cobbler track and you want to head up that way. This is the entry just here. Um, starts off with a little climb straight away. So the last video you would have seen uh, Matt and I coming back from Mount Speculation. We actually came down this track. Uh, this is a few weeks after that. We decided to go back and drive some of the hills we came down uh, in the opposite direction. And look, generally these tracks here, all in really good condition, um, well graded, uh, pretty easy drive really, uh, quite scenic um, and a really good alternative, particularly in winter. Um, the bottom end or western end of Lake Cobbler, if you're wanting to head through there, um, it tends to get pretty wet, pretty soft, pretty muddy, um, even at the best of times. So this is an alternative, it'll join you up with the middle section and bypass that, that wet, slippery, muddy section of the Lake Cobbler track if you were looking to head from here through to that valley. So excuse me for my voice guys, I've had a cold um, but did want to get this video out so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, yeah as you saw there, nice nice easy start. Um, some good gradient there which um, the external camera is probably doing a better job of capturing. That's Sam and his new MUX. Um, some big changes he had with the previous version MUX and he's loving that new one. Drives a lot better, almost like a different vehicle he was telling us. So um, yeah, really cool to learn a little more about that. Um, Matt's driving his Prado. Uh, again, this is probably the second or third trip for him uh, in his Prado. He's come from the Troopy, big change, um, but he's loving the Prado. Um, and it's probably a little more comfortable to drive as well. And here comes Jared in his Colorado, probably the least modified vehicle in the, in the in the group today. So he's got his dual cab Colorado. I don't believe he's got a lift there, and no front bar or winch either. So pretty standard approach angles for a dual cab view. Um, and he had his all this stuff to the um, way. Nicely done. So 
it's always interesting, you know, with a group um, with different vehicles, everybody chooses their own line. Just goes to show, you know, whatever vehicle you've got, if it's a four-wheel drive and you, you've you've got a proper transfer case, um, just get out there and, and have a go. You don't need to wait until you've got all the gear, particularly if you can go with other people. Going solo, as, as we do a lot, you certainly need to have uh, have some gear with you for recovery, but in a group, uh, you can rely on your friends. So you can see here, this is sort of Clay Hill. It's um, a little bit rutted down the bottom, but um, again, nothing that, a little bit of throttle control um, didn't, uh, didn't mitigate. It's just a long, steady climb. I've got the inset camera there, so that's from the GoPro 7 mounted on a new mount that I got that sort of hangs it's clamped on the, the front bar. Not completely convinced that's the best way to use it, but um, try and get some more interesting views with um, that particular camera and mount in coming videos. Fairly typical of a lot of my country tracks this one. And again, you can see that um, the bush is still recovering from the bushfires now from two years or so ago. It certainly takes a long time. Yeah, just nice and steady on the throttle control. A little bit bumpy in sections, but yeah, not, nothing worry too much. It's certainly an easier drive than that western end of the Lake Cobbler track if you're looking to go through that way. And here comes Sam in his MUX on that same section of the track. Again, the external camera footage probably gives you a little bit better idea of the rating. Not crazy steep, but it's certainly enough that you know you're driving up the hill, that's for sure. View back there to the Buffalo Valley. And here comes Matt with his Proto. And Jared in the Colorado making a short work of it as well. Which is one of those people that pull over on the track wherever they feel like it, especially on a climb. So like a lot of the tracks in the high country, this track does turn into a bit of a ridgeline track uh, in various sections. Um, and there's the spots you get some really good views. As you can see, weather's cleared up a bit. The grey skies that we saw earlier have sort of disappeared. Um, and it's um, turned into a really nice day. It was a great day to be out on the tracks, wheeling with a bunch of mates. And again, you can see like this, this track's just in really good condition. Very easy drive. And you probably remember from the last video that you follow this, if you follow this all the way through, it links up with uh, the Lake Cobbler track about halfway along its length. And yeah, as I say, bypasses that, that very wet, slippery, muddy western end. It's a lot nicer drive too than taking the, the twisting winding road that can be fairly corrugated. Um, and while it's a nice view following the river there, it uh, does limit your speed and it tends to be not the most comfortable drive. So you have views out both sides again as always with the uh, vehicle mounted GoPro you don't necessarily get the benefit of that um, with its forward facing. but. Uh, there was certainly plenty to see along this track, that's for sure, and it didn't seem to take us all that long either. It did just seem to continue going up and up and up. It wasn't even that high from memory. This track tops out at a bit over a thousand metres. So it's probably a, a climb of around 400 metres or so. Uh, uh, sorry, around 600 metres or so over the length of it. But um, 
yeah, every time you sort of crested a hill, you seemed to have another one in front of you that was going up again. Plenty of these washouts to divert water off the track to sort of limit erosion. A little bit of sheetrock just there. Again, there was no issues on this track at all with traction or anything like that. Uh, just running pretty standard tyre pressures around that. Um, I think I dropped them down to 22 on the front and 25 on the back. Not expecting anything particularly difficult. Little steep section just through here, or steeper anyway. He was actually riding with me at this point, if I remember correctly. Again, the external camera here gives you a bit better perspective on just, just how steep that little section of track was. You can see Mark down there taking some footage, I think, with his phone. So there's Matt in his Prado. And again, that Prado doesn't have a lift either. And Jared in the Colorado. So again, just goes to show you don't, you know, need a two-inch lift. Sure, it's nice to have, um, but you don't need a two-inch lift to be able to take your vehicle off. That's for sure. Just be a bit judicious about the line you choose and where you choose to drive it. Like everything, always drive to the conditions and the capabilities of your vehicle. So probably included a little more footage along here on the. Dandongadale spur track than I perhaps needed to but it does change a lot as you can see here that the tracks cut into the side of the hill and you've got that fairly steep drop away on the left hand side so it goes from being a ridgeline track to a track on the side of the hill again like a lot of tracks in the high country really just wanted to show you guys um, the different parts of this track um, give you a good sense of it so if you wanted to get out there and tackle it for yourselves you can see what you're, you're in for. This section doesn't seem to be quite so well graded as some of the earlier sections, but again, not what you would call difficult. Definitely an easy option for getting through to Lake Cobbler. We did have some low-lying cloud uh, as we are getting through to some of the higher points here. So as is often the case in the high country, the weather sort of was changing almost, um, you know, every few minutes. Um, and it did turn into a little bit of a whiteout in some of these sections. Most of, the, most of this track though was very much like what you're seeing there, well graded, even surface, plenty of traction um, and the small sprinkling of rain that we had, it was a great day to be out with a few mates because uh, the little bit of rain that had been very early in the morning kept the dust down so 
those behind weren't covered in a cloud of dust, which is always nice. Nice when it doesn't happen. And it meant the vehicles could all stay fairly close together and stay in touch as well. Now, as I say, I've probably included a little bit more footage in this section than I perhaps needed to, but I had a lot of comments lately that people really liked the longer format video. And look, clearly you guys can skip through if there's uh, sections that are not as interesting to you as other sections. For those that are interested, something like this video has probably taken me about five hours to edit this um, and put together. So just coming up there on the turn off to the McCready track. So that's a track that I have never actually driven myself. It's a one way in, one way out track, so a little bit like the speculation track that we drove a few weeks ago in that regard. And by all accounts, there's a campsite down the bottom there. So one of the last um, sections before we turn off. And here comes Matt and his Prado. And Jared in the Colorado. Yeah, some sections like this don't look like it gets heaps of traffic. So from that McCready track turn off, it's about 3Ks to where we turned off at the Walsaldine track. So not too far at all. About halfway along is this high point here, which was a bit of a whiteout with the low-lying cloud at the time. I think uh, if the cloud wasn't quite so low, you probably would have had a bit better view from up here. Uh, looks like people have had a bit of a campsite there. As long as it wasn't too windy, I reckon it'd be a cracking spot for a campsite, particularly uh, with the sun coming up in the morning. And as it's just come up on the screen there, that's the elevation of about a thousand metres. So it's about halfway between the McCready track and the Walsadine track turn off on the Dan Buffalo Divide track. Just a short run down here to the turn off. It's probably one of the little rockier, bumpier sections. Again, nothing particularly difficult. You can probably see there from the footage that um, the, the cloud cover is certainly dulling things down a little bit. Now the interesting thing here to note, so I had the Pajero in low range, first gear, manually selected, and you would have seen my brake lights come on there, so uh, low range and the Pajero is not super low range, and I do find that I still need to brake. Now this is Sam in his new MUX. Now he's telling me that his previous MUX, which is the previous shape and model, was probably fairly similar to the Pajero. So once again, Sam's got this in low range, first gear manually selected. Watch his brake lights. So he's maintaining a pretty constant speed there. Just a little touch on the brakes, just there, just once. And then as he's got to the bottom of the hill. But if you can recall when I've gone down, and he's slowed down quite a lot because he wanted to, but he could have probably kept going there without touching his brakes. So 
a lot more driveline braking built into the new MUXs than the previous version, and certainly a lot more than I get in the Pajero. The engine braking is just something that's not great in the Pajero. Now here comes Matt in his Prado. And again, we're all running auto boxes. So Matt's in low range, first gear selected. Again, look at the brake lights, no brake lights on. It's just doing the job for him and controlling his speed quite nicely. And Jared in the Colorado. Now he's pulling up to pick up the cameraman so we can get to see him actually drive it. Can I get a lift, okay. mate? Alright, buddy, sure. Better hop in. Thanks. So just quite interesting there on a hill like that uh, to see different vehicles. Again, not a super steep hill, but just the difference in how they drive. So this is a turn off here to the Morseldean track. And this is about 12 k's from the start of the Dan Nongadale Buffalo Divide track. The Morseldean track's about eight kilometers long, takes you down to the Abbeyard Road. And uh, most of it runs along the side of the hill with some great views. You're just catching some glimpses there at the left hand side. This particular section here on the top half or the first half of it, not as well maintained or graded as some of the other tracks, but still a pretty easy drive. Fairly scenic. You can see there a um, pretty rocky hill it's been cut into. And lots of low lying cloud on this particular day when we're driving the track here. Well, well worth uh, well worth the drive and like a lot of tracks every time you go down you seem to go up again and this part of the bush didn't seem to be quite so affected by the bushfires this seems to be some I don't know if this is a weather station or a transfer station or what this is exactly from here down to the, tr the road the track was in really good order so I'm guessing that this water track was originally cut in as an access track for maintaining and collecting data from that station there, whatever that does. Because um, from here down it was very well graded and maintained. Nice ridgeline section here, I'd love to see this on a clear day. Tracking views as you can sort of gather there, pretty much 180 degrees in front of you. So this could be one to add to your list to, uh, to check out. Again, not a super difficult track by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly one that gives some good opportunities for some great views of the valleys in the area. Nice long steady descent here. And uh, as I said, this, this lower section is really well graded and um, just a nice easy drive. And you spend a lot of time working your way back down these valleys. As I said, this section here is about this section of track is about eight kilometres long, but we cover this fairly quickly in the video. A little bit rockier in sections here, but also fairly wide. Typical of a lot of high country tracks with that steep drop off on one side. And here we are approaching the bottom end of the Warstein track where we'll turn left onto the Abbey Yard Road and then head about five or six k's north up to the crossing of the Buffalo River to take the Durling track up to the ever so lovely named Mount Buggery track. So as I said, the Abbeyard Road is in really good condition at the moment, or at the time this was filmed anyway, which was uh, back in May of 2022. And we've just reached the crossing there and we're heading down across the Buffalo River. So steep, rocky little entrance. Now, when I drive down here, listen for the sound. Hear that bang? 
sounded like a bash plate, I don't think it was. I think that was the beginning of something that we're seeing a little bit later on in this video. Now, the water wasn't particularly deep uh, at this time. Um, the exit was a little, had a steep little muddy pinch to get out, um, which made it a little bit interesting. Um, and definitely had been uh, dug out and rutted by some that had come before us. I just elected to drop the tyres in the ruts and drive it. I'm generally fine with the IFS, I've got plenty of clearance and I've been pretty happy with the wild peaks, um, so I drove it quite okay. Next up was Sam in his MUX, so he's the only one of us that was actually running mud terrain tyres. Taking it nice and steady there, down that rock ledge. Before heading into the water. I think Sam makes this exit look about the easiest out of any of us. I did give it a little bit of right boot to get up, but he just drives up there almost like he's driving in a car park or something. So this is shot on my phone from the front. Nice and light on the throttle. Really steady and just drive straight up there, basically no wheel spin at all. Nicely done. And Sam is running a two inch lift on that MUX, so next up we've got Matt in his Prado. As I said earlier, no lift on the Prado, completely stock. Does have the uh, bar on the front with the winch obviously, so he's got probably a little bit better approach angle than the factory. He's opted to try and span those ruts, put, once, put his right hand tyres up on the bank and drive up the middle and again he's done that nice and easy. As you can see from the front there, probably shows it a little better. And again, nice steady throttle control, no wheel spin. Nice line! And he's made that look very easy. So last up is Jared in his Colorado. Now a couple of things here, I've never driven a ute um, with a tray or a tub or anything on the back, I've never driven a ute off-road, um, so a couple of things here, he's got no load in the back, um, so that could be a factor, and his tyres are almost great tyres, he was focused on that exit, and you notice the cameraman still on the bank here filming, he was supposed to pick Mark up. <laughs> So Jared's opted for what I would say is probably the correct line there, um, but he, as you saw his, his rear tyres have just slipped off, they haven't been able to hold him there. He's probably not quite as far over as Matt was in his Prado, and you can see the tyres there are just filled up with mud. And he's just not getting the traction to get up the bank. Okay, you're in the ruts! And I think he doesn't have the clearance to come straight up the way I did and the way, uh, on the, left -hand line. the way Sam did with his MUX. And I think I've confused his issue there because I'm saying take the left hand side and I'm meaning my left. Left hand down. And, um, and he's lining up to do the left hand side from his approach. More. So I'm More not sure I was down. actually, no, I was actually helping him here left at all. Left hand down. Yep. He's prob oh, you want to try this side? There's a big vertical step up though. He was probably wondering why I was saying left hand down, but to do the left hand side, which from him, his end is my right hand side. Does give that side a go. Again, gets the front up, but the back just slips across into those ruts and he loses traction and just isn't able to get up there. Just, uh, so, yep. So I'm not sure how much of that is 
the tyres. I think the tyres are definitely a factor. And how much of that is the fact that he's got a um, cab chassis with not a lot of weight on the back to, to help those rear tyres get more traction. Yeah, we could come back and winch you if need be, mate. But I reckon the left-hand line's still the, still the best one. And I'll get out of your way so you can just keep the momentum. Left hand, as in right hand for him, of course. Yeah, well, what was happening was your front wheel was fine. See the cameraman on the far bank over there? Into the hole. That was the issue. So I think if you can get that way as much as you can on this go, you'll be good. Bit more mumbo. That's it. And yeah, he's driven straight up that. He's probably a little further over as well. That's it. So yeah, slippery little exit there on the Durling track. The rest of this track is uh, nice, solid gravel, pretty easy driving. It's about 4Ks from the river crossing there up to the Mount Buggery track. Um, so where we join onto the Mount Buggery track here is after the summit. Um, we're going to head north up to the SEC track um, and then head east across towards Golden Spur but instead take the Yarrabula Creek track. And of course, like every track in the high country, plenty of uh, steady climbs. Again, not super steep. So this could make a really good loop if you were looking for a day that wasn't a super long day. You could do this loop, come out um, from the Mount Buggery track and then either take the um, Yarrabula Creek track up behind Lake Buffalo or take the SEC track back to the Bitumen and uh, back north that way if you wanted to or even Goldie Spur. Um, across to Buckland Valley. Plenty of options if you didn't want to have a very long day out on the tracks. So yeah, it doesn't take too long to travel the 4Ks um, and this is where the Durling track joins up with the Mount Buggery track and we're turning left to head north. And again, in this section, the track's well graded. Pretty easy drive, but always nice to be out in the high country. And from here, it's about 5Ks through to the SEC track. We're past the main, main summit at this point. sort of hanging around as well. Apologies for how my voice sounds. As I said, I've had a cold for about the last week and was putting off recording this as long as I could, but keen to get the next video out for you guys. Hopefully it doesn't sound too bad when I uh, edit it together. And you can see that's the SEC track just down there on the right. So this is the tail end of the Mount Buggery track where it comes down and joins up with the SEC track. Driven this a few times, you do have to watch where this joins on. You sort of come into the inside of a right-hand corner on the SEC track. So it pays to have a good look before you pull out because you can't actually see too much of the track. And also you're pulling out onto a, a, where the SEC track actually falls away on the far side. So you don't want to swing too wide when you take this um, take this turn either. Obvious reason why it's called the SEC track. And you can see what I mean there. You've got the bank on the left hand side, a little bit of a bank on the right, and you're on the inside edge of a corner. So you really can't see a lot. And then you've got that lip straight in front of you where it drops away. And from here, it's about a two or three K run down to the start of what we call anyway, the Yarrabula Creek track. 
this SEC track is basically a gravel road. Uh, it's a pretty easy run, um, all things considered. It's um, some great views of Mount Buffalo. Uh, and if you continue on along here and take Dolby Spur, that runs right behind Mount Buffalo um, and gives you some of the best views of Mount Buffalo that you can see just about anywhere. So that's it up there, covered in cloud. So this is the bottom end of the SEC track and on the right hand side there is the start of what we call the Arabella Creek track. Doesn't seem to matter what time of year you do this thing, um, there's always a little bit of mud around. I always say with this track the only thing that varies is the depth of the mud. And there's a lot of bypass tracks on this um, on this track as well, so you can sort of choose your own adventure a little bit. So here's everybody else just coming in to the first part of this track. So Sam in the MUX, Matt in the Prado, and Jared in the Colorado. sections of this track are fairly well enclosed at times as well and a lot of the a lot of the mud puddles look exactly like that it's very hard to tell exactly how deep they may or may not be it does pay to check them out a little bit beforehand that one wasn't particularly deep as you can see there through there uh, fairly well. The yeah, cameraman was getting wet feet at this point. What I want to hear, Sam's taking it nice and steady and slow, getting the least amount of mud on his vehicle. Clearly he was he was saving up. You can see what I mean there about some of the sections of this track are a little bit overgrown. I don't think it gets a lot of traffic necessarily. And yet I certainly have found the odd tree down on various parts of this track as well. Um, a few sections like this will have the odd little bog hole and muddy section and yeah it's just a really interesting fun track to drive usually not too difficult usually wet usually muddy bottom section follows along the Yarrabula Creek before turning up and climbing up over the range uh, joining up with the Yarrabuck truck and a track and eventually you can get all the way through up to Mount Selwyn Most of the times I've driven this, I usually run into a couple of people coming the other way. So that's fairly typical of what you'll get presented along this track. Um, choose your own adventure, left or right. Look, I generally try and take the line that looks like it's the main track line and stay on that, um, if at all possible. Sometimes there's good reasons not to. And as you can see there, there's another alternate line just on the left-hand side there. This wasn't particularly soft, certainly not deep. Um, it looks like it has been soft, but on this particular day it wasn't. I've driven this bog hole before a couple of times, but it's quite bushy. this particular time I ended up taking the bypass and it's also a bit deeper and wetter and muddier than it has been the last few times I've done this track, so this particular day Sam was the only one of us willing to have a go, which 
Probably made good sense given he's the only one of us running that tyres. I think I'd be going the other way now. And you can see the, the amount of mud that's actually in, in there where he's pushed that up um, above the water level. Sensibly he's got the winch rope clipped up, clipped up on his antenna. A little bit of backwards forwards there. Now he did tell us later as well that it was actually his throttle control and whatever setting he had it on that was causing it to cut out on him a little bit. Left and right on the steering wheel. Get the sidebinders digging in and he's pulled through. Nicely done. Now this track is usually a good bit of fun, but uh, we didn't actually get as far along this as we planned or hoped because I was getting progressively more and more noise coming from the front of the vehicle. Um, and it was sounding like a metal on metal grinding sound that actually started back on the SEC track and was getting worse and worse. Included this just to prove to some of you that have asked the questions, do I ever check the depth? Yes, sometimes I do. Um, yeah unwarranted and unnecessary in this particular case but um, yeah sometimes I do check the depth this looked deeper and softer than it actually was as you'll see when we drive it a good example though of you just you just never know this could have been three feet deep or it could have been half a foot deep like it was So, as I was saying, it's not coming through on camera for whatever reason, but we were getting... You might have heard it just then. Probably talking over the top of it. We're getting this metal-on-metal metal grinding sound. It sounded like it was coming from the front left tyre or front left wheel. And the further we drove, the worse it was getting. Tried driving in two-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, Four-wheel drive, high range, low range, didn't really seem to matter. The sound was there pretty much the whole way. And as I said, the GoPro is not really picking it up. It was certainly in the cabin, it was very noticeable. And the guys in the other cars could actually hear it as well. Maybe it's something to do with the frequency of the sound. So we're just pulling up here. The guys are going to have a look and see if they could see anything. I've already had a look under the car at this point, trying to see if there was something, you know, I was even wondering if it was fencing wire that had picked up on the track and wrapped around the front wheel or something of that nature. You can't see too much under the front of my car with the bash plates on there. It kind of covers everything. I guess that's the whole point of them, but it's good and bad. Spotter there to make sure I don't run Mark over. So that sound, I don't think that was me on the brakes, I think that was the sound that we were hearing. It's a bit weird that it's the same side as the CV boot as well. Yeah, but it's pulling to the other side. It's like yeah. So as well as the noise, the car was actually physically pulling to the right-hand side. Definitely. Bit of user error there on the jack. Is that thing tight? The pressure? Yeah, I believe so. No, it wasn't. <laughs> we might have to get a rock to put it on. 
Well, I mean, it hasn't jacked up at all, hardly. Let me just ask the other guys to bring their jacks. Yeah, that's not moving. First time using my jack. It's always good to be familiar with your own gear. I'll get. Uh... So this is the tail end of a attempt at a trackside repair. First time I've used my jack. Um, we've got some um, sort of pulling on the steering and metallic on metal on metal sounds coming from that front left wheel. Um, now I knew I had a torn CV boot, but we can't see anything else in under there. Um, the way the steering's pulling makes me think it's something to do with the steering box or the power steering. Um, anyway, we're going to quit while we're ahead today and, uh, and call it a day. It's a shame it's been a cracking day on the track. Um, fortunately, no one else has come along while we've had this blocked. Um, so we're just going to have to find a spot to turn around. We're, we're probably only 20 minutes, half an hour into the Yarrabula Creek track. Mark's doing a top job there as trackside mechanic and um yeah it's disappointing that so that noise was so bad the guys were actually thinking i was going to have to call a mechanic and get it towed or call a towing and get the car recovered and towed the bizarre thing was once i got back to the sec track the noise completely went away never came back um did get the car in the mechanic they had it for a week it, they, re, they replaced the front right, so not the left, but the front right wheel bearing and the bushes on the upper and lower control arms were apparently both pretty shot. So apparently that was causing the noise. Nothing sort of super critical. Um, the, you know, the bearing wasn't quite so bad it was going to fall out or anything, but it certainly wasn't in a good way. So car at this point had done less than 100,000 Ks. I've now replaced three out of the four wheel bearings. So. The front left wheel bearing is the only one that hasn't been replaced. I did ask the question, should we perhaps do that at the time while we're there? Um, but apparently not, time will tell. So again, this was just before the variety trip. But thanks everybody for watching. This is kind of long, um, not probably one of the most exciting videos, but hope you guys have enjoyed it nonetheless. Catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching.